the mayor and council, I'd like to welcome you this evening. Also, it's my pleasure to introduce the mayor who is going to be your master of ceremony. Before we begin tonight, I want to first of all congratulate all of you on actually finding your way into the center. Because if you'll recall this time in January when we met next door at the youth center, uh, those of you who parked over here had to leave the meeting to come move your car. So we solved that by renting this beautiful facility and let's start by giving the staff of the Jacksonville Conference Center a real welcome. Thank you for your hospitality. At this time, Mayor Phillips. Thank you, Dr. Woodruff. And on behalf of the city of Jacksonville and our city council, uh, I would like to, it is certainly my pleasure to welcome all of you to this year's uh, volunteer banquet. Uh, our, this is the fourth, actually the fourth annual advisory uh, committee banquet that we've had. Uh, this is National Volunteer Appreciation Week also, and the city council and I, along with the city staff, are honored to have the opportunity to uh, be able to uh, express our gratitude for what you do for this city. Again, and I've told you this many a times, without your input into what we do, it would be almost an Im impossible job for us to be able to have taken this city to the point where we're at right now. And I think that everyone sitting here has had some, some uh, participation, some input to get this city to this city that we are now, the city that we're very proud of, our city. So at this time, I'm going to ask uh, our city attorney, Mr. John Carter, to uh, lead us in the invocation. Mr. Carter. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you giving thanks. Thanks for this day. Thanks for your blessings on us individually and on our city of Jacksonville. Tonight, we especially give thanks for our board and commission members, for their service, for their giving of their time and their talents to make our city the very, very best. We pray for our military, who many tonight are in harm's way, who are serving us, defending us. We pray for their safety, for their anxious families. We give thanks for those who prepared the food that we are about to enjoy. And we pray that this food would be used by our bodies and that you would allow us to be used by you in service to you. All this we ask in your holy name. Amen. Okay, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started uh, with the program here. I want you to continue eating. I eat fast. Being a former police officer, I had to learn to eat quick because a lot of times you had to leave it on the table because you got a call. So don't, don't you know, you got, y'all take your time and um, enjoy your dinner. Again, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight uh, for our fourth annual uh, recognition dinner for the uh, all our different volunteer uh volunteers for the city on our commissions and boards. Um, again, I can't tell you uh, how much I appreciate what you do for us, uh, the advice that you give us, and uh, you do such a good service to this city by just expending your time and energy. On the third, on January 3rd this year, we met in a joint session, as you'll remember, for our annual uh, summit. And this year we focused on our motto, a caring community. We ask you to tell us what you as citizens and leaders in the community felt we should be doing, uh, what we should be doing right as a uh, caring committee, community. And we ask you to tell us what we could do to make this a better caring community. So out of this summit, we got many good ideas uh, from y'all. Y'all had to express many that evening, uh, and tonight we have asked our staff to provide a presentation on moving forward with the caring community ideas relative to the January summit. Now I'd like to call upon <clears throat> uh, Dr. Richard Woodruff, if you'll come up now and uh, introduce uh, all our different speakers. As we begin tonight, I hope you enjoyed the food. And let's take just a minute to thank the staff. Uh, Carmen, the name of this catering company is? 
Class Act Catering. Please join me in a great supper. Thank you very much. As the mayor said, in January, we met and asked you some questions regarding how we improve the community as a caring community. When the staff met with the mayor earlier this year, we discussed a volunteer dinner. And normally what we do is we ask a speaker to come and talk with you about volunteerism. That has been successful. But we feel that based upon the things which you identified in January, it would be appropriate for us to continue that dialogue and to fill you in on many of the things that we are doing to fulfill the suggestions that you gave in January. You will recall that the question was, how can we become a more caring community? We broke up into small groups. Each of you represented the various committees that you're on. We also had members from the Youth Council. You'll notice in this picture, the blonde here is one of the members of the Youth Council. Laura, you can thank me later for that, wherever you are. There you are. Okay, that's good. But through the ideas which you had, uh, we benefit. As the mayor said, the input that you give us through your monthly or bi-monthly meetings, the input that you give us through these sessions in January as we prepare our budget is very, very important. We asked and we listened. You filled out forms. And there are several things that we learned from sitting as a staff and as a mayor and council and listening to you give those reports. Among the things that we learned was, number one, we as a staff were not doing a very good job of letting you as committee members know what's really going on. You know what's going on in water and sewer, because Jim certainly makes sure that that happens. You know what's going on with beautification. Ms. Williams makes sure that that happens. You know what's going on in parks and recreation. Homer always does that. All the other committees, you know what's going on in your committee. But one of the things that we realized was we were not doing a good job of telling you about things with the city beyond your committee. So one of the things we hope to do tonight is give you more information on citywide efforts. The second thing that we realized is that communications always can be improved. So tonight and continuing with your sessions as you meet on a regular basis, we're going to be there as a staff, not only to discuss the things about your committee, but also answer questions and give you information that is citywide, not just your committee information. The third thing that we realized is that we need to identify actions to unify Jacksonville as one city. We made lists, and now we'd like to give you an update. On the issue of how we become one city, the mayor came to me about two weeks after the meeting, and he said, we are a caring community, but we need to put a new focus on it. The mayor suggested that we bring in a cross-section of the ministerial association or the ministerial group. I don't think there actually is an association. So he invited 14 of the leading ministers through the various congregations of the community to come in and meet with him. And over the last three months, we have met many times. And through that, the mayor is pleased to be the sponsor, along with the council, for a new initiative. It's an initiative that is designed to improve us as a caring community, to engage all segments of the community, and to provide leadership from the elected officials. That effort is called One City, My City, Our City. If you think about it, that's what a caring community really is. It's one city. Every city has its subdivisions. Every city has its different populations. But I think you'll agree there is no city like Jacksonville that is more integrated in every fashion, age, race, sex. It doesn't really matter. We are a totally committed and totally blended community. So when this committee came to the mayor and suggested the title One City Campaign, he and the staff thought that was a great idea. So the new focus for the next several years, you're going to see this continually. 
one city, my city, our city. To accomplish that, the group of advisors suggested to the mayor that every month we have an official activity that focuses on the one city campaign. So what you're going to see beginning this coming Friday is Art Block. And all of the members that are on the mayor's advisory group will be coming down for Art Block. We hope you and others will also come out to Art Block. And then you'll notice throughout the year, it's hard to believe May comes in this coming week. We have things in May, June, July, all the way through Winterfest in December. But these are going to be advertised and promoted as the One City Campaign so that we can get every segment of this community out to continue to work together and to make sure that we are removing any barriers that may exist between any portions of our community. There were many other suggestions that were given and we'd like to focus on three or four of those in the program tonight. One of the suggestions was to work on partnerships. While we have great partnerships between the mayor and council and the staff, we have great partnerships between the mayor and council and you as the advisory groups. We have great partnerships between the staff and you as committee and advisory members. There are many other partnerships that we need to create. The largest partnership is with the military. We're very fortunate that the current general, General Widely, who unfortunately will be ending this tour in another month and will be moving to Okinawa, but the new campaign that has been offered through federal legislation is this campaign of military and civilian contracting. We'd like to spend a minute to talk to you about the multiple opportunities that that's going to give the city of Jacksonville. Here are just a few. You know that Anthony Prins and the traffic folks, they now control all of our traffic lights, 73 intersections. What you may not know is that we also are working with the base so that the major intersections on the base will also be in our traffic management system so that when the base releases, that the traffic signals that are very close to the main exits of the base will be able to coordinate those with the traffic signals throughout the community. When it looks at recreation sharing, Susan is currently working with others on the base to talk about the athletic fields at TT. Those, those fields are just off of 24, easy access. What our goal is there is to find a way that we can change the gate so that those fields are outside of the gate and then we can have multiple uses for our recreation programs by adding those fields. If you think about adding four or five fields, what you've actually done is save the taxpayer almost a million dollars. When you build athletic fields and when you light them, it's not free. So if we can utilize partnerships for recreation on the base, it expands our opportunities, it expands our partnerships, it saves tax money. Facility sharing. We're now opening up the Center for Public Safety, the Police and Fire Department, for major events that the base wants to hold off the base. We're also opening up on May the 17th, we're gonna have an event in city council chambers where over 100 of the base leadership want to have an off base event to come in and talk about the community and how they can inform the young Marines about how this community operates. That's gonna occur in city hall. Transit, we've been working transit for a long time. There are improvements that we can offer there. Water and sewer, while we provide water and sewer for the folks outside the gate who are in the city, why not work with them and determine how we can, as Ron Massey calls it, wheel water so that we produce water, but it's bought on the base or with the extra water and sewer capacity, I'm sorry, the extra sewer capacity on the base, why not let some of our sewer, I know that's a great after dinner conversation, by the way, <laughs> I know all you water and sewer people, y'all are just salivating right now, I love it, okay. But you know, why not use some of that capacity? Other things, setting up base tours to help our economy. There are many things we're gonna be looking at with partnerships. We obviously have partnerships with others, the Onslow Community Outreach. 
I would remind you that this mayor and council, with advice from y'all, have worked with the Onslow Community Outreach to purchase the old Piggly Wiggly on Hargett. It has now been refurbished with a sprinkler system, which the Community Development Block Grant funds paid for with the council's approval. The inside has now been substantially gutted. The exterior parking lot has been completely rebuilt and is now a beautiful thing. That type of partnership helps. You're going to hear in a minute about the partnerships that we've created to address slum and blight and how we've created new housing opportunities. And part of that is code enforcement. So let's begin now with community development partnerships. I'd like to bring up Lily Gray, who's our community development director. And Lily's going to walk you through some of the leadership activities and how her department is addressing some of the things you identified in January. Lily? Now, I have to ask for clarification. Was that clapping because I was finished or because you were welcoming <laughs> Lily to the... Okay, it was for Lily. I got it. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you, Dr. Borger, for the opportunity to share this information with the members of our advisory committees. As the screen is showing you, partnerships defined is simply no more than two or more people working together to solve problems. One of the partnerships that I'm most excited about and work with on a daily basis is our code enforcement team. As a community development administrator, you can see by this slide, we have three code enforcement officers in the city. We have our chief zoning and code enforcement officer who's here tonight, Gary Willette. He would raise his hand. Does an outstanding job leading his team. And then we have two zoning and code enforcement officers, Phyllis Arp and Frank Brill. These three officers, I must add, um, I'm very proud of this acknowledgement. They, as a team, all three of them have been recognized as zoning code officials of the year by the North Carolina Association of Zoning Code Officials. So we're very proud of that designation. In their area, these are the ordinances that they enforce, are public nuisance violations, junk vehicles, minimum housing, non-residential structures, which are our commercial buildings in the city, and zoning enforcement. They work on zoning enforcement in, par in partnership with our building inspections and permitting and planning section. Statistically, we receive complaints from a number of sources. We track them by anonymous complaints, whether a citizen calls in or stops by the office, Employees are also um, providing feedback. For example, our sanitation workers, when they're out, they're, I don't know how many sanitation workers we have, but each one of those employees are a set of eyes. So as they're driving their routes, they can provide feedback to, uh, to us as to where we have violations that need to be addressed. We often get calls from our city officials. They respond to their constituents and send um, uh, properties or items that need to be addressed. Great partnership with our fire and police department as well as they're out patrolling and they identify issues, they bring those back to staff. And the largest number on that screen, which I'm most proud of, is the code enforcement officer themselves. They're out doing proactive enforcement on a daily basis. As you can see, we they've responded to over 1,500, almost 2,000 complaints just in the last year or two. When we track the actual number of cases, we track them by the initial inspections. That's when they get a call and actually go out to verify if a violation actually exists. We track zoning inspe inspections, notices, and cases. We're almost up to 3,500 cases a year with um, three code enforcement officers responding to those. The process is quite simple. We receive a complaint. We respond. Within 48 hours, we provide a notice. They have three to 15 days to comply, and they can comply themselves as a property owner. If they don't, the city can abate the nuisance and um, place a lien on the property for the cost of the abatement and $200 fee. What's not shown on this slide is how we address minimum housing cases, because that process can be quite lengthy, depending on the significance of the repairs that need to be done. But a similar process. They do receive notices of violations. <laughs> This is an example of a public nuisance, nuisance violation, a high grass and weeds complaint, anything over eight inches on average, if you don't cut your grass this time of year, is a, is a violation of our code. This is what one case looked like. This is what it looks like after code enforcement has addressed the issue. Let's see. Next, junk vehicles. Um, they come in all shapes, sizes. 
boats, trucks, trailers, jet skis, you name it, uh, commercial equipment, we see it all, and we work to have those removed as well. Minimum housing cases, this is what a typical minimum housing case might look like. This is what it looks like after the minimum housing violation has been corrected. And then we have our non-residential, our commercial structures. This is one that was on College Street. And through our voluntary demolition and clearance program, the correction was to just remove it. And then we have our Clean and Green, initi uh, Clean and Green Jacksonville initiative. And we must give credit, if we could just give a round of applause to Dr. Richard, Richard Woodruff. This, <laughs> this is his brainchild. And if you have not heard about it, I don't know where you have been. But this is something that we're very proud of. And it's designed to improve the overall appearance of the city. You see major um, corridors that have been landscaped. There are now beaut beautification projects all throughout the city. And of course, we focus really hard on demolition of dilapidated structures. And just last week, we celebrated the demolition of our 100 structure since 2010. <laughs> and here we are. Last week was actually National Community Development Week. And these two houses there where you see the backhoe was house number 99 and 100. And we have our very own Mayor Pro Tem Lazar, who, <laughs> who led the, the first blow to our structure, the ceremony, ceremonial blow. And this is the structures as they were coming down in our group photo. And this is important, an important picture because it shows the teamwork that's involved. <laughs> I mean, from police and fire, sanitation, streets, planning, permitting, community development staff, transportation. I don't know, know of any department, recreation and parks, that's not involved with what we do on a regular basis. This is more another picture of the demolition. And this is what it looks like today. 100. Thank you. And the value and the benefit of demolishing these st structures was so that we can proceed with some revitalization efforts in downtown. This is what downtown looked like before. This is Newberry Street, if I'm not mistaken. This is, this is another one on Newberry Street, what it looked like before. This one is a, a special one to me. I don't know how many of you remember Tony Isler, who was our rehab specialist for many years before he passed away. This is him taking some pictures one afternoon at the corner of Court and Poplar Street. And this is what that intersection looks like today. This is downtown revitalization. This is our downtown housing initiative. This is clean and green Jacksonville. There's another shot of some other areas in downtown. We see life coming back to downtown. I was not here in the 70s. Or I hear all the stories of what downtown and Court Street mayor knows very well what it used to be. So when I hear the stories and see the transformation or hear the comments of how far we've come, it makes me very proud. These are the latest two homes that were constructed. We just had a new homeowner move into the Blue House just last week. Um, and I want to thank Ryan. He made note yesterday in a staff meeting that it's not just the construction of the house or the demolition of the house, but it's the, the changing of lives. For that family, their lives have been changed. And so we're proud of that partnership, not only with our internal staff, but the partnership we make with our new homeowners. It's all part of a caring community. And it, it just makes me proud to have been a part of it. And here's another one of our homes on Court Street. And this picture, when I was looking through it, I said, why would I want to put this picture in? It's not a complete picture of the house. But what was significant about this picture was the two chairs. And the fact that it is now safe to sit out in your yard in downtown Jacksonville and enjoy a nice spring day and not have criminal activity um, making you a prisoner in your own home. So the chairs represent the new life in downtown Jacksonville. And so going forward, we know we, you, many of you have heard that we have new flood maps that have been released, which has had a major impact on our ability to construct new homes in downtown. So we'll identify new target areas, and we will replicate this model in other areas of the city. And we will continue with demolition number 101. And we will meet you again at number 200 and celebrate all over again. That's my presentation. Certainly proud of Lily and the team, Ryan, all the people from Street Department, Public Works, everybody. 
Uh, the rumor that Mr. Lazara has put into the pizza business a delivery vehicle like the one that you saw him driving is only a rumor. But the reality is that's for his giant 36-inch pizza. He only delivers in that vehicle with the big pizza. And it's got to have everything on it. Is that right? Uh, the pizza man delivers. Okay. And demolishes. One of the high priorities that we hear each year is the issue of when are we going to build a swimming pool? So we thought it would be a good idea to give you information about what we are doing with water facilities and opportunities and also give you some reality checks regarding money. I'm going to ask Susan Baptist, who's our recreation director, to come forward now and give you information regarding our water activities. Susan. Good evening, everybody. If anybody needs to stretch after dinner, I will not be opposed. After all, we are recreation and parks, and we like everybody to move around, so feel free. Uh, thank you, Dr. Woodruff, Mayor, and Council for the opportunity to give this information about. I would be remiss not to uh, agree that we do get this question quite a bit, but hopefully after tonight, we will share with you some inf new information and then kind of give you some ideas as we move forward in the in the city. So obviously we have um, some opportunities we want to share and let you know. Today we're, I want to share with you, we have a splash pad. Raise your hand if you've seen it or been by it. That's fantastic. Thank you. And then we'll tell you about some pool research that I've done and then to kind of just cap it off with the, uh, other opportunities. Splash pad, what a great success that was. It has been a phenomenal opening last year, May of 2016. We're marking down the days. It'll be open in less than a month, and we are getting calls, and everybody is extremely excited. We had a fantastic summer. We had lots of kids. Uh, I put on here 60 as average, but I think that's a low number personally. If you go out there any given day on a nice day, it was much more than 60. So that's a great thing. Nothing but positive remarks. Um, and for the cost and with the help of Lily's um, CBGB money, we were able to fund that through those funds, and it is just a phenomenal asset to the city. So this is our current one, and we have uh, some great pictures there. Those are actual pictures of the splash pad, so you'll see those uh, hopefully in the next few weeks as well. So moving forward, uh, after the success we've had with the Jack Emiet splash pad, we have uh, been so fortunate that council has agreed to fund another one. If you haven't heard, we're going to be doing a lot of investing into our Northeast Creek Park. We're very excited about bringing that park back up to its uh, full potential. It's been a few years since it's seen a, a, great, a great renovation, so we're going to be doing that. And one of the great things we'll be doing there is a splash pad. It is going to be located on the playground side of the, of the park, and it's going to be a neat, uh, an, another great asset. And I think it'll meet the demographic on some another side of town, and we're very excited we're in the planning stages of that. So splash pad, that'll be coming soon. That'll be here before you know it. And then we've identified roughly in the next few years a potential of a third splash pad. So stay tuned. We will be planning um, diligently behind the scenes on those splash pads since they're such a great success. Uh, and one of the things we wanted to share with you today, for those of you who don't know, while we don't have any public swimming pools, we do uh, try to meet the demands. You know, being in recreation and parks, we feel like swim lessons are extremely vital to our community. It's a public safety, and we want all of our children and adults to know how to swim. So one of the things we implemented several years ago was, how can we, com how can we meet this need? What can we do to do to uh, provide swim lessons to the citizens, to, to those kids that don't know how to swim, or adults. Truthfully, you'd be surprised at how many adults don't know how to swim. So we partner, like Dr. Woodruff mentioned, we partner with several apartment complexes. And we say, can we borrow your pool? We want to provide these swim lessons. So we do that with two apartment complexes right now, very successful. We offer a full range of swim lessons all throughout the summer uh, for all ages, from infants to adults. And we're very pleased that every summer, uh, we at least serve at least 140 participants. That's just in one year, and we're at least five years into it. So you can see the numbers 
I, I won't do uh, math in public either, Gail. So, um, but you can roughly add up. That's a lot of uh, that's a lot of impact, and that's what we want to do. We want to provide a safe haven and a, a safe and good community uh, community need for our, our citizens. We're also partnering up with the Jacksonville Country Club this year. This is new for us, but we want to provide a opportunity for our kids in our summer day camp to swim. We have over 300 kids in our summer day camp, and if we can keep them here in our community and utilize our um, facilities that we can partner up with, why not? It's a great it's a great partnership. So we're very excited. Our kids in our summer day camp will be utilizing that uh, pool in the off hours from the country club. So it's a win win for all of us. And then also we're looking at other ways can we can partner. What what other pools are there? What what are other ways we can try and to provide the need of a pool to our citizens. And we've discussed, uh, Dr. Woodruff and several of the management team has discussed, okay, what pools are there? And Holiday City has a nice pool. We're talking with them. Can we maybe lease it? Can we utilize it? Is there a way for us to provide a public pool space for our citizens and not um, you know, potentially go down the road of, of building a pool? So that's what we'll show you here. Um, so we realized that in the industry, and that's the industry of recreation and parks, there's several types of pools. And so I'll show you an outdoor pool, which is just your basic summer pool. I'm sure some of you grew up with an outdoor summer pool. It's one that's operated on a seasonal basis. And then it's just kind of there for the kids to swim in. And then obviously you have your indoor pools. It can be a competitive, a large size, or it can be a basic indoor pool that, you know, that the kids can come play in but on a year-round basis. And then you have the larger complex, which is your pretty much your competitive. It has a warm-up pool. It has your lap swimming. It has really nice facilities to it. So here's just some pictures of your basic outdoor pool. I would consider that a recreation outdoor pool. And then this is just some, uh, some quick analysis that we were able to do on an industry trend, uh, trending. This is what it costs to build a pool. Obviously, square footage, this is the length is a basic size. You're looking at you know, over you know, half a million to you know, upwards of that. Again, you're talking about operating it three months out of the three months out of the year. You have to staff it, but then you have your chemicals. You're looking at an operating cost of you know roughly fifty to seventy-five thousand. User fees are basically going to be the ones you would charge your citizens, and then that would be for the summer to recover those costs. So that's your basic outdoor pool. Moving into your indoor pool, using that same concept of a pool but indoors. Obviously, expenses are going to be a little bit more. You have your overhead. You have a building. You have lots of other variances that come into play as far as what size you want. You know, you have to air condition, heat, those sort of things. These are some examples, again, using the same um, analysis trend-wise. Some of these pools and complexes have been built in North Carolina. They range from 2.4 to 3.1 million dollars. Those are other complexes that have been built in the state within the last five years. Again, you can look at operation cost and, and maintenance cost. Large difference. You have a lot more building to cover. You have a lot more days. You have a lot more hours, so on and so forth. So these are just some of some of the analysis that we've done. Obviously, you can charge a little bit more. You have a little bit more opportunity for revenue, um, but you just you would have to recover the cost as best as you could with what you can bring in. So this is your basic indoor pool, and then we kind of go to a large complex. This is where you would really get into your competitive opportunities bringing in potential economic impact or your swim teams and utilizing this. But this is what you would see in, in a, say, a college sort of setting, the natatoriums. Again, considering the size, considering the maintenance, you can see the cost goes up exorbitantly. Uh, these, this is just, again, for you to, to put it all in reference. Uh, and obviously, the opportunity to, for revenue is about the same, but you have a few more opportunities as far as economic impact. If you can bring in tournaments or swim meets, I should say, not tournaments, but you have that as an opportunity as well. So then we move into water parks. Uh, water parks are something that we've seen in trend-wise. A lot of communities are going towards water parks just because of the versatility. You, have, you can service a lot more families as opposed to individual swimming. You know, some people want to be able to service their whole family and bring it out and make it a day's event, like we see with the splash pad, versus, you know, a swim team. 
or me swimming lanes, those sort of things. So we see a lot more of this, the water parks and splash pads being built across the country. Um, and so these are just some examples. And I'll be honest with you, this one's a hard one to, to pin down as far as a, a cost analysis. It is, um, it is as large as you, you know, people want or as small as people don't want. I mean, there's just so many variances there that it was just difficult to try and nail down. What we do know is it's pretty pricey to build. <laughs> it's not cheap. Obviously, there's a lot of, that goes involved when you start really moving that amount of water through a park and keeping the chemicals where they need to be so that they're safe for your citizens and your users. And typically, to keep in mind, a water park or something along those lines outdoors is going to be really on a seasonal basis. So you have to, you know, to try and um, nail down that really is a hard one to do as far as a maintenance and a operating costs go. So these are just some examples. This is a range. We wanted to give you everything from what we currently have to what we are trying to meet and what we're doing and what we're currently offering to moving forward is those decisions that obviously mayor and council are, are the ones to have to uh, address that with our citizens. So um, here, uh, and I appreciate the opportunity. So thank you. Now, the rumor that Mr. Thomas is going to be in a Speedo at the Olympic pool is only a rumor. But on the other hand, Kathy, that could be a Christmas present. OK. Let's talk about some other signature programs that the city is involved in, and certainly Clean and Green is one of them. The environmental group and Ms. Williams and her group have for years, decades, I think is the correct word, talked about the beautification. Michael LaCroix and his folks do a fabulous job of working in our parks. If you have not been down by Riverwalk Park, and Paula is down there every day with her wonderful German Shepherd, but uh, we're currently taking the second block and stripping out the weeds and putting in new sod. So if you're down that way and you see that uh, what looks like dirt, it guess what, it is because the sod has not come in yet. But we're also completely redoing the sprinkler system down there. Throughout the city, the program that the mayor and council have endorsed is certainly better landscaping. You can ride around the city, whether you're at the Freedom Fountain or whether you're in other locations, and you can see beautification that we are extremely proud to be presenting to this community. The great news is that over the last several years, especially last year, we began to work on landscaping our major thoroughfares. You've seen the work on Huff Drive. You've seen the work on Jacksonville Parkway. And as those plants mature, they're really going to be another year away from just absolutely being dynamic. We're very pleased to tell you that Anthony Prince and Ron and other members of the staff have been able to secure an additional $300,000 in DOT money to help us at Piney Green in 17 and Piney Green in 24. Now, there'll be no landscaping in that portion of Piney Green that's not in the city. Because for some reason, people think we should spend tax money outside the city. But we believe that only the taxpayers should get the benefit of the tax money. Is that selfish? I don't think so. OK. So. We'll be concentrating in those two areas very shortly. And you can see additional uh, areas. Code enforcement really helps us with picking up litter on the private side, and Michael's people pick it up every day of the year. Curbing, one of the pieces of equipment that the mayor and council authorized in the current budget is a mower. But it also has an interesting tool on the front of it. It's a great big disc, about 18 inches in diameter. It weighs 50 pounds. And instead of the system that we used in the past of basically putting the mayor out there with a shovel and him sitting there and you know going behind the curb line, although that helped his physique to hold the twin granddaughters, it really you know was a slow process. So Michael came up with this piece of equipment. And what it does is you simply lift the wheel up, put it behind the curb, and you push it with the lawnmower. And just simply wait cuts off all of the debris and vegetation that was growing over the curb line. This is an example on Belfork. But you can see all over the city now a 
sustainable way of us cleaning our curbs every year. And believe me, street sweeping and cleaning the curbs, it says something about your community. You know it says something about your community. DOT mowing areas, the DOT has turned over to the city more and more of the areas. They pay us a phenomenal amount of money. <coughs> but, but even so, pardon me, but even so we're appreciative of the $16 a year they do pay us for maintaining the area. But the council has supplemented that significantly because this council and this mayor have listened to you as advisors who have said you want a better looking, cleaner community. Pending projects, Western Boulevard, the mayor and council have in the proposed capital improvement budget that they will be hopefully adopting sometime in May or at least by the end of June, about $50,000 that will come out of the four cent initiative so that we can get onto Western Boulevard, the area north of 17, and begin to have substantial landscaping all the way up. So hopefully over a four or five year period, you will see very nice landscaping funded by our taxpayers, approved by the mayor and council that will move that landscaping and beautification all the way up Western Boulevard. We've mentioned already 17 in Piney Green, 24 in Piney Green. A couple of other exciting things that are happening, Jacksonville Landing. My goodness, it was only five years ago when this facility did not exist. Matt Ray was out there in 12 degree weather in January, putting his boat in the water so he could go out and catch supper instead of going to Long John Silver's. <laughs> but I'm telling you, every day, it doesn't matter how cold it is, every day you will see dozens of people using this facility. Well, when the mayor and council looked at the concept, one of the things that they wanted to add was a welcome center. So if you look at the graphic, the little red square there is going to become this, a visitor center. While we have restrooms at the launch point, we're going to have a welcome center and additional restrooms here. And this is what this facility generally looks like. It's going to have a very nautical theme. It's going to be very low maintenance, but it's going to be a welcoming feature so that whether it's the tourist development money that is presenting an activity or whether it's the council or whether it's somebody else who wants an event, this facility is gonna be there as a welcome center. This will actually begin construction this coming October and maybe even sooner. Another thing is the Riverwalk Marina. If you have not been down to Riverwalk Park and come down to Kerr Street Park, and if you have not seen the changes that the city staff has made in the marina, I encourage you while you're downtown tonight, swing by there. The facilities that were there were not, in my opinion, quality facilities. They did not speak well for the neighborhood. The city council purchased that for $450,000, a lot of money. But we have received two grants, one from PARDAF for about $350,000. And we're very pleased to announce tonight that Duke Power has given us a $100,000 grant to assist in refurbishing this facility. City Council is matching all of that with about $400,000. And if you go by, you will see that the city staff, not contractors, have over the last many, 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 many weeks pulled out all of the old boat slips. They've taken off the old covers. They've pulled out almost all the pilings. And beginning probably again in September or October, we will build a first class floating dock system there. And as part of that, there will be a long boardwalk that goes out into the river that will have at the end of it a seating area that's covered and a fishing area. So on a Sunday afternoon, if you and your lovely spouse, I started to say wife, but I guess some of you women have handsome husbands. So if, if any of you would like to go down there and simply sit and enjoy being on the water, that's going to be free. Now the 17 boat docks that we'll be putting in will continue to be for rent. Dr. Lesane has already ordered a 38 foot 
nice skiff, and he's agreed to take all of his planning advisory board members on weekend tours. The only thing is you have to pass the teeth test, okay? <laughs> but this is Riverwalk Marina. This is what it used to look like. And you can see now that some of the components are being dismantled. And then we come to one of the other major projects that the council has been working on in that Sturgeon City. Civic and Environmental Center is now under design. We confirmed today that the project is 95% designed for architectural from the architectural company. We hope to have it out for bids within the next 60 days. And then this will be a very, very nice facility that will house many events of a community nature. Of course, the facility will be leased by the mayor and council to the Sturgeon City Board, and it will be the Sturgeon City Civic and Environmental Education Center. Many things are happening downtown. New sidewalks, the possibility of changing from four lanes to two lanes with central medians. We've been working with the council and with all the property owners. And coming in the next several weeks, you will actually see new sidewalks poured. If you've been down in front of Boomtown, there are no sidewalks there anymore. Wally and his staff worked to get some very quick bids out, and the contractor is literally in there last week pulling out almost 100 feet of sidewalk, and will be improving the sidewalks phase by phase over the next several years. And we're looking at how we can continue to beautify. Now, my third grade grandson drew these pictures, and so I'd appreciate a round of applause for him since he did, okay, he did a good job on that. But uh, the green is supposed to be landscaping. The orange color is potentially additional parking. The purple color is potential areas for drop-off and deliveries. The main thing, though, is the mayor and council realize it is time for us to address the four blocks between City Hall and the middle school. That area has great potential. It has strong businesses that are there today, but it also has the potential to do even more. Greenways and trails, let me go back one. We're very pleased to tell you that if you have not been through the Memorial Gardens, go over there. The Greenway and Trail is now complete. The last phase comes through the Memorial Gardens. So you now have a loop where you can basically begin downtown, go all the way out to the gate, join John Carter and his wife on their double bike. What do you call that? Bicycle built for two. That's a double bike. OK. Bicycle built for two. Ride that whole rail. It will get you all the way back downtown. Northeast Creek, Susan mentioned it. This is going to be one of the focuses that the mayor and council have agreed to work on for the next three or four years. We're going to be investing significantly in rebuilding Northeast Creek Park. Staff projects $1.5 million or more dollars going into Northeast Creek as our major focus in parks for the next three or four years. Downtown Circulator, you talk about partnerships. You know that the county is rebuilding are building a new consolidated human services building on college. That building is now operational. In order to tear down the rest of their facility, they, the existing facility, they needed to have the parking lot completely removed. They contacted the city. The city said, we can set up a downtown circulator so that your off-site off parking, your employees will not have to walk three or four blocks. So literally every 15 minutes, the downtown circulator all day long is free. If you're just doing nothing at all and would like to take a ride around and just look at downtown, there are all kinds of places you can simply park your car, get on the bus, ride around. But that's a cooperation that this mayor and council have with the current county commission. And we cannot stress enough the importance of that partnership. And I personally commend the mayor and council for reaching out and creating that new partnership with the county commission. We can go on, and we want. Multimodal center could look like this. New parking lots around the community, community mental health. We're going to end on this one. The city of Jacksonville is not exempt from mental health issues. There's no community in the country that's exempt from mental health issues. 
we realize that we have to take the lead in identifying solutions. Back a month or so ago, the mayor and council met with the county commission. They agreed to appoint a task force. Two of your elected officials, Mr. Thomas, Mayor Pro Tem Lazera, are appointed by the mayor and council to be on that task force. And what we're trying to do is identify how we can create a facility in this community to house people who have mental or addictive issues for a period of two to seven days while they're trying to find a longer term solution. This is a problem that you identified. This is a problem the mayor and council are working on. At this point, we'd like to thank you for your courtesy of listening to me for a few minutes, but I'd also like for you to do me a favor. Everybody in the room raised their right hand. Okay, that, everybody got the right hand. Some people had the other right hand, but that's good. <laughs> everybody got the right hand. I'd like for you to turn that hand this way. Turn it backwards. I'd like for you to pat yourself on the back, okay? <laughs> These things happen because your mayor and council are concerned and want to provide leadership for this community. These things happen because you have helped identify that these things need to be a priority. Thank you very much. At this point, I'd like to turn the program back over to the mayor. Special thanks to Dr. Woodruff and his staff for giving us that fine report. That's very, very good information there. Uh, to let you know what exactly is going on here in the city of Jacksonville. You know, one of the things uh, I did want to say, uh, in keeping with the green, the green and uh, clean and green campaign that we've had going for some time now, the centerpieces that are on your table tonight, uh, we're going to replant those throughout the city. So, uh, in keeping with that, uh, I think that's a a good plan. I'm sure we have identified some very good places yeah, to put them. What the them. mayor said is don't take those with you. Don't, don't take them with you. <laughs> yeah, we'll cut to the chase. Don't take them with you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. This time I'd like to acknowledge uh, each of our advisory committees along with their council liaison and staff. And uh, as I call, if you would please stand and uh, be recognized. First, I'd like to ask our members of the Board of Adjustment to stand, along with their liaison, Council Member Jerry Bittner. And our staff person is Gary Willett. Um, our Environmental and Appearance Advisory Committee. Would those members please stand? Our liaison to the Environmental and Appearance Committee is Council Member Angela Washington. She was unable to be with us tonight, but thank you very much for what you do. Next is our Planning Advisory Board. If you would all stand. I know we got a few there. <laughs> Along with our liaison to the Planning Board is Councilman Robert Warden, who's sitting over here. Our Community Development Advisory Committee, uh, their liaison is Councilman Jerome Willingham. <clears throat> Our Recreation and Parks Advisory Committee, also uh, Council Member Jerome Willingham is the Council Liaison. Thank you. And last but not least is our Water and Sewer Advisory Committee uh, with the Council Liaison is Council Member Randy Thomas. Thank you all very much. Um, I'd like to also acknowledge uh, the supporting services provided to our advisory committees by our many, many staff members, and you saw some of them also stand with the uh, committees. 
uh, and also the support that's given by the city clerk's office and the city manager's office and our media services. Uh, they provide a great service to your, your different, your various boards and, and commissions, committees. <clears throat> Occasionally, we seek to recognize special citizens whose contributions to the improvement of our city have made a huge difference. This evening, we add two more to a long list of those who have helped do this and to a short list of those who, have, who we have recognized. <clears throat> and at this time, I would like to ask my good friend, uh, Mr. Bill Hemingway, if y'all help him up. Good friend and moral supporter, Mr. Bill Hemingway. There are a few organizations in Jacksonville that have not benefited from the wise counsel of William Conrad Hemingway. He had a distinguished career of 20 years in the Navy. It's, it served as a prelude of many more years of service to his community. He served with the United Way, the Red Cross, the Jacksonville Lions Club, the Jacksonville Oslo Chamber of Commerce, where he served on the military and government affairs committees, and he was a member of the Board of Directors for Marine Federal Credit Union. And of course, he was a member of the Fleet Reserve Association Branch 208 since 1955. His direct service to the city began on September 28, 1970 as the city clerk. The duty of the city tax collector was added to his title in 1971. And in 1972, he served as the city finance director for the for a period of time. He left our city employment here on May 3rd of 1988 after much appreciated service. In continue, it continued with serving on committee, uh, a community complex task force in 1992, the city bond for recreation committee, the civic center ad hoc study group in 1999, and he continued his volunteering and was recognized as the Outstanding Veteran of the Year in 1988 and recognized by the city for the Fleet Reserve Association Veteran of the Year in 2010. He served on the Onslow County Tourism Committee for more than five years and today serves as a director with the Jacksonville Tourism Development Authority. He has been active in the development of the Museum of the Marine, for which he has, has, was also a past board member. Bill Hemingway is an example of exemplary service to our community for his advocacy for those in need, to protecting his fellow service members and retired persons, to his passion to help share the hospitality of his beloved city of Jacksonville. I'm honored this evening to ask to present Bill Hemingway with a token, token of our appreciation. Uh, and this is just a token of our appreciation. I can't express to you myself how much Jacksonville has benefited from you being here, Bill. Thank you, Thank you very much. And this is for his dedicated service to the citizens of the city of Jacksonville, for his passion to help make this a better place to live, work and play, and a more caring community. Thank you, Bill. Thank you. This is a, this is really a nice uh, go ahead a nice tribute. Please sit down. You know, I, I said I went to work. I told you read it all, but I had a pleasure of dedicating the building across the street to Mayor Tichy, and I guess that's one of my major accomplishments with local government for, in my mind because I was asked to do for making opening comments about the building. It's a beautiful building. 
And I also want to say this. When I went to work for the city, our relationship with the base and some other things going on wasn't very good. I asked the mayor, I said, uh, do we belong to the Chamber of Commerce? No, we don't. I said, well, I'm going to join on my own because we need representation at the Chamber of Commerce. And it, believe me, I'm a strong chamber person and an organizer and all those other things they said about me. And it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you all for coming and honoring myself. I appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you so much, Bill. These two gentlemen here that are with us tonight is Presley Hill and Ricky Hill. They are nephews, first cousins. first cousins, I'm sorry, of a good friend of the city of Jacksonville. And I want to take a moment to tell you a little bit about that friend of the city of Jacksonville. Oliver Fletcher Hill passed February 2nd, 2017 while serving on the Onslow Civic, Civic Affairs Committee and after a long service to the people of Jacksonville and Onslow County. A resident of Stella, Oliver's connection to the city was official and ambassadorial. He served as counsel and connector between causes important to the city and to himself. Most recently, he served as a significant connector to the council for the arts and was a powerful and consistent voice and force for the city's weed and seed program. During that program, he helped organize efforts to advance small business development in the targeted corridor and led efforts to be the voice for connection for young black males. He continued in that work with many notable leaders, including Chief Michael Yanero, Reverend Joel Churchwell, and Grover Lewis. He continued his mission as a liaison serving St. Julia, Julia AME Zion Church, and many other causes. That church congregation loved him, and he loved them back. Oliver's career had started with poverty prevention programs and ended after he founded the Northeast Community Development Corporation, which continued his mission until his passing. Having received the posthumous and deserving award as part of the fabric of our community, Oliver Hill is this evening recognized for his service to Jacksonville over a long period. He is recognized for his advocacy to make Jacksonville a better place, and he's recognized for tireless work to make connections that made a difference in our city. Among his last public appearances was for Freedom Day, just a few days before Christmas. Oliver served as a bridge for the many opinions on the observance and, the demonstrate, and demonstrated his dedication to the cause with full participation, even clowning for the camera during a promotional video recording session. For many, that picture of a smiling, collaborative Oliver Hill is his legacy. Oliver Hill will be missed and is missed by this community. You know, it's a sad day we don't hear that voice, that booming voice of Oliver, Oliver Hill, and you know what I'm talking about, gentlemen. But he cared about this community as much as anybody. And I am very proud tonight, Presley and Rick, Ricky, to present to you in memory of Oliver F. Hill for his dedicated service to the citizens of the city of Jacksonville, for his passion to help make this a better place to live, work, and play, and a more caring community. And I want to thank you for coming and being with us tonight. Thank you. You're here representing a fine gentleman that meant a lot to this community. Thank you very much.
I'd like to say thank you uh, from the bottom of our heart on the behalf of all of our family. We could not represent such of a man with many talents. All of us have had so many talents and he was a man of many statures that we never ever dreamed that he had. But tonight, on the behalf of his family and to the city of Jacksonville, Mayor, we say thank you for allowing us to come tonight to receive this award on our behalf. Thank you. I know as many of you do, just like me, I wish he was here to accept it in person. Uh, before we end the evening, on behalf of myself and the City Council, I want to thank you again. Uh, I can't express to you enough how much your service means to this city. Our, our city is privileged to have devoted volunteers like you serving on our boards and committees. And each of you give up many hours to various projects and issues helping to make Jacksonville the best it can be, sacrificing your own personal time your own personal energy for the greater good of your fellow citizens and your community. The council and I want you to know that your service is important and positively impacts the city of Jacksonville and the quality of life of our citizens. To thank you adequately in words is totally impossible for me to do that tonight. But each day as you travel about the city, we hope you see the improvements that are taking place we hope you feel as proud as we do what we have accomplished working together to make this, in my opinion, the greatest city in the world. There's no place else I'd rather be. <clears throat> A Habitat for Humanity leader uh, Elizabeth Andrews said, volunteers don't necessarily have the time, they just have the heart. Thank you for having the heart, and thank you for coming and having a wonderful evening. Thank you.